Good morning, Shalom. Good morning. And welcome to our worship. The first week after Easter, isn't it? Yes. Oh my goodness. And, and, and so nice to see everybody here. And next week, it'll be Bring a Friend to Church Week. <laughs> well, no, I made that up. I'm sorry. But uh, I thought maybe it'd be about time to do something like that. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, the announcements for this morning are on April 30th. The Earth Day Expo is at the Reach Museum from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. The Expo will feature the Drive Electric annual event. Try out an electric bike, talk to master gardeners, and see Laura Rathbone at the Sustainable Tri-City Table and more. Join us for feedback today where a special guest from Aid Africa will talk to us about the Village Restoration Project. The nursery is open, and children, uh, uh, the child care is now available from 9 a.m. through the end of feedback. The nursery will be open to infants through pre-K beginning at 9 a.m. and each Sunday. Uh, kindergartners through fourth grade will stay in the sanctuary for the service until they are invited to, to join the kids' learning community in Ginny's room. If your child is in that age group and needs child care before the time, please bring them to the nursery and the teachers will help them transition to the kids' learning community when it begins. Please remember that a parent, guardian, or older family member will need to sign them out. That's so smart. I think that's all that we have for announcements. Thank you. says I get to take my mask down. That's really amazing. Okay, I'll just do that. I'll just do that much today. Oh, and I didn't welcome the people who are still watching and, and listening on Zoom. I think that's such an important outreach for our church, and I'm so glad we do that. Uh, I know a lot of us uh, have taken so much advantage of that over these uh, horrible years. But we're here, see, we're here, we're here together. A lot of us are here together, so it's getting better. It's always getting better. Uh, and here is our call to worship. Would you like to stand for that? We walk in wonder beneath the sun and stars. Creation is God's masterpiece, and we are blessed to share it. We give thanks for the air, the land, and the water. And for all the creatures that join together in the web of life, beauty is before us, around us, over us, and beneath us. We join our hearts, minds, and spirits as one in thanks and awe. Our first hymn this morning is number 28, For the Beauty of the Earth.
Many of my colleagues refer to this day as Low Sunday. I prefer to refer to it as Calm Sunday. <laughs> calm Sunday, which things are a little bit calmer than they were on Easter, but, uh, but uh, Easter, we must remember, is not a, not a day. It's not a Sunday. Easter is a season, and we continue the season of Easter for the next, well, not for 50 days, but, but uh, beginning last Sunday for 50 days to the time of Pentecost. And so we come on this Sunday sharing our joys and concerns with each other. You'll notice in the bulletin on the back, there's a notice that it's Pacific Islander and Asian American Ministries Sunday. And so we give thanks for our partnership together with our siblings in Christ. We also note today is Armenian uh, Armenian Martyrs Day, and uh, this is a day to, uh, to remember the memory of the victims of persecution that began on April 24, 1915, one of the worst atrocities uh, of, the 20th, of the 20th century. And so we remember today one and a half million Armenians who were deported and marched to their deaths and we mourn the tragic loss of, of such lives. We have, uh, it's also because it's the Sunday closest to Earth Day. It's a day I also like to, rec to recognize as Earth Stewardship Sunday. So the message a little bit later today will be on that subject. A couple of concerns and joys that we received in the church office this week. Some of you may know that uh, Nancy B who suffered a stroke nearly two and a half years ago, was able to, uh, well, has not been able to attend Shalom regularly since that time. Uh, but the news we received this week is that after two years of rehabilitation, she's back in her townhouse, which is wonderful news. Her son helped her move downstairs and has set her up with many frozen meals. And she has graduated from wheelchair to a walker and was quite happy to take a drive with a friend to get an ice cream. And so if anyone would like to uh, uh, telephone Nancy, uh, you can get that information in the church office or speak with Mary, uh, Mary P for the phone number. We'd also like to express our gratitude to Mary and Larry J for the purchase and assembly of the chest that we have beside the organ console, the chest is a nice addition to the music corner of the sanctuary and is able to contain uh, several items used in our music ministry. So thank you to Larry and to Mary. And Anna's husband, Andy, is going to have surgery on Monday morning. That's tomorrow. And so for Andy and Anna, we uh, are asking for thoughts and prayers for the surgery to go well and for a recovery to be without incident. Cards, emails, of course, prayers and thoughts are, are welcomed and very much appreciated, especially as Andy misses being with the Shalom community. So let's remember Andy uh, and Anna throughout this week ahead. Other concerns or joys that we'd like to share, simply raise your hand and Joyce will bring you the microphone. She'll hold it very close to your mouth and we'll ask you to speak clearly. <laughs> I guess I front-loaded all the, the uh, joys and concerns today. <laughs> Catherine, speak clearly. <laughs> I met a new immigrant from the Ukraine. Her name is Alona. She doesn't speak a word of English, but I found out that there are programs on the Internet that help people learn the language, mm -hmm. and I think CBC will too, so I'm grateful for all that. Yes. Calm. It's a calm <laughs> Sunday. Calm. <laughs> Thank you. In your uh, bulletin is the prayers of the people. And this Sunday, as I mentioned earlier, is themed around Earth stewardship. And so I ask us to observe a moment of silence and then we will pray together the prayers of the people. 
Let us be in an attitude of prayer. For all those around the world who have lost their homes, livelihoods, or communities to the climate crisis, God, hear our prayer. For our non-human siblings whose habitats are destroyed by effects of greed and accumulation, God, hear our prayer. For decision makers that their choices might create a more beautiful, whole, resilient world. God, hear our prayer. For our own church, that we might be bearers of hope and resilience in our community, a place of refuge in the midst of crisis and disaster. God, hear our prayer. Creator, forgive us for our wrongdoings against you and your creation. In your name, may we work toward a new creation, one in which all creatures are free from the bondage of greed and accumulation and are able to flourish into their creatureliness. May this church be a site of redemption, resilience, and hospitality, an extension of your love to all who are affected by the climate crisis. In this land, this structure, this community, this worship, may we love you more fully by seeking justice for our neighbors. Amen. We invite the children to uh, step forward so we may share a couple of moments in children's chat. Oh, thank you for coming today. Get all my papers organized here. All right, here we go. Friday was a very, well, you haven't had a chance to meet my mother, right? You don't know my mother. But Friday was a very special day for my mother. You want to guess what was special about it? That's a good guess, birthday. Any other guesses? I brought a picture of my mother to show you. Here we go. What do you think? Isn't she beautiful? <laughs> what is this a picture of? Oh, yes, here we go. There's a picture of my mother. And for my mother who's actually online right now, uh, you also look beautiful as well. But this Friday was a special day for my... Now, why do I call this my mother? I don't, I'm not, it's a big ball in space, this earth that we live on, isn't it? Some people, <laughs> that's, a, that's funny. Uh, so earth, some people call earth our mother, mother earth. Have you ever heard that? This is a picture of mother earth. Now, why do you think some people might, why do you think some people call our earth, Mother Earth. Yeah, that's where we live with. We, we, we live with our mother, don't we? We stand on it, we live on it. How does, and we sit on it. How is the earth like a mother? Well, does a mother take care of their children? Yes. Does a mother help feed their children? Does the earth, 
Yes. Does the, so in the earth, does the earth help feed us with food? By growing plants? Yes. There's a lot of ways that the earth, our mother, takes care of us. The question that we had on Friday, which was Earth Day, Mother Earth Day, oh, it went dark. I have to put another quarter in. Do you have a quarter? <laughs> I'm teasing. <laughs> no, we just have to put in the password. Okay, there we go. The, uh, what was I saying about our mother? Oh, our mother, so there are things that our mother does to take care of us. The question I want to ask you on this Earth Day weekend is how can we take care of our Mother Earth? Any ideas? Pick up trash. That's right. It, when we pick up trash, that helps keep our mother healthy, right? And happy, too. That's right. What other things can we do for our Mother Earth? Well, let's ask some of these folks. What can we do for our Mother Earth? This is the part where you can talk. <laughs> we can tend a garden. Oh, that's a good idea. Conserve energy. We can conserve energy. Compost. Compost. What else can we do to help care for our mother? Be careful with fire. Be careful with fire. Stop fire. The Stop the pollution. pollution. Thank you. There's a lot of. Th oh yes. That's right. We can walk instead of drive, or we can ride our bicycles, right? Yes. There's lots of ways that we can take care of our mother. And I think uh, that it's important to remember that Earth Day is not just one day out of the year. We have a lady in our church by the name of Mary who has a t-shirt that says, every day is Earth Day. Every day is a good day to take care of our mother Earth, right? Right. Well, we're going to invite you now to go to Learning Community. I'm so grateful that you are here today. <laughs> and uh, we uh, will have this opportunity for, you will have this opportunity to learn some more in Learning Community. So thank you. <laughs> What's that? We come now to a time of offering, our call for gifts and offerings. Before we're asked to give anything, we must first acknowledge that we are first and foremost receivers. And this is especially true as we ponder God's good and marvelous creation. God invites us to claim our birthright and adoption as God's partners in healing our earthly home. We invite the ushers to come forward so that we may share our morning's offering.
offertory prayer. With grateful hearts for all we have received, we offer these gifts, O God. Our hope is to give tangible expression to our desire to join you in expressing our three great loves, love of children, love of neighbor, and love of creation. We offer our gifts and ask you to bless them with the Spirit of Christ who showed us how to care as you care. Amen. The scripture reading is from Psalms 148, 1 through 5, and 7 through 13. This is for Earth Day. Praise of the Eternal One. Praise God from the heavens. Praise God in the heights. Praise God, sun and moon. Praise God, all you shining stars. Praise God, you highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the love, for God commanded and they were created. Praise the creator from the earth, you sea dragons and all creatures of the deep, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind fulfilling God's command mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, young of all genders alike, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Eternal One, for God's name alone is exalted. God's glory is above earth and heaven. Here ends our reading.
Thank you, Joyce, for reading Psalm 148. That's actually not the New Revised Standard Version. I found a, a version online. It's from an inclusive uh, author. It's an inclusive uh, version of that uh, Psalm one, uh, 148. You could look at the, uh, any other translation if you want to see how they handle that psalm. But I really like that translation or that paraphrase, I suspect, of Psalm 148. Take another look at that in your bulletin. There, there's so many reasons to enjoy this beautiful poem. Uh, psalm 148 is a psalm that reminds us of our place in creation. Where is our place in creation in that psalm? If you read many of the psalms in, uh, in, the, in the Bible, many of the psalms put humans, quite honestly, at the center of things. That is, you know, humans praising God or all things uh, in, on earth uh, uh, were created for us and, and so forth. But this one is different. Psalm 148 puts humans in a different location. In fact, I don't think humans show up in the psalm until about the 11th verse. <laughs> because what is important in this psalm is the non-human praise of creation. Psalm 148 reminds us of our place in God's creation. And surprisingly to many, Humans are not at the center of God's creation. Truly, we're an important part. But according to the psalmist, we are not its center. All of creation is to praise God, it cries out this psalmist. All is alive to God, is acted upon God, that humans are not the only creatures who are recipients of God's care. As that old hymn, hymnist once wrote, all nature sings, and round me rings the music of the spheres. Isn't that lovely? That's the psalmist interpretation, I mean, the, a hymnist interpretation of the Psalm 148. That nature is continuously praising its creator. Well, what do you think about Psalm 148? It's, uh, is it just merely poetic license or romanticized anthropomorphianism? Or is there something profound going on here with this song? I mean, what if, what if humans were not at the center of creation? According to Psalm 148, we are equal to creation. Creation is equal in its command of praise to God. And that is the whole of creation is about divine praise. And because that is so, so our place is to not only to be a part of that and to demonstrate our love to God, but also our partnership with all of creation that gives praise to God in their own way. I think the psalm has important implications for earth stewardship. That our role as humans is not to subdue and have dominion over all that is created. Rather, we are to join a chorus of praise that gives thanks to God and seeks to protect against all that would needlessly destroy creation. So writes John Holbert in his commentary on this psalm. He says, it's not too late. It's not too late for our conversion to become lovers of and partners with God's world, but we must be honest. It is surely getting very late. It is getting very late. I don't know if you've seen the paper for uh, the Tri-Cities Herald today, but if you go to the letters to the editor, you'll see one of our own has been printed this Sunday. On Earth Day Plans, Laura Rathbone has written, uh, and I'll just read a few of these words that came out this morning. And unfortunately, well, I'm saving paper by not subscribing to the local paper, right? Uh, other than digital, 
But when you want to print, <laughs> it's tiny print. So bear with me as I read a portion of her letter. April is Earth Month, often a time when, uh, often a time when we ask, <laughs> we ask for better glasses is what I need to ask for. A time when we ask what we can do to protect, protect our fragile home. The IPCC report released this month is a vast compilation of the latest scientific research on climate change. The, fi the findings are dire, with rapidly growing risks of global damages, some irreversible. In a two degrees Celsius warmer world, flood damages nearly double over 1.5 Celsius warmer world, with each increment of warming uh, bringing increased risks of new and worsened destruction. Our current path we cannot stop, uh, at our, on our current path, we cannot stop warming at the 1.5 Celsius goal. In other words, things are dire. We didn't need Laura to remind us of that, but I'm glad that Laura has done that and also lifts up a, a very important event that will be taking place in our community next Saturday, Earth Day Expo. But we already know, we already understand that climate crises and ecological calamities are at our doorstep. To keep the earth from warming above the critical degree of two degrees Celsius, climate change action needs to take place. It needs to take place globally, uh, and that includes corporations as well as nations. Which, be, let's be honest, feels exceedingly overwhelming at almost all times. But these feelings of being overwhelmed doesn't mean that you and I need to feel helpless. Our actions are important. This is one of the takeaways I, I received from an interview I read this week with Suzanne Simard, the author Finding the Mother Tree, a book that many of you are reading here at Shalom. Shalom. Suzanne Simard is a conservation scientist who teaches at the University of British Columbia. And Dr. Simard says that it is important for people to understand that all actions, all actions that we take to address global climate change are important. And let me just read a little bit more of this uh, interview. There's a tipping point that is negative and scary, she says. But there's also a positive tipping point. Ecosystems are designed, she says, to heal themselves. They are wired to be whole. And she says that there are intelligent, that, that uh, creation is intelligently designed to transmit across systems information and energy to keep them whole and strong. And that's the thesis, really, of her main research uh, on mycor mycor mycorrhizal networks, uh, that there's an interconnectedness, that there, yes, there is a competition that takes place, but there is also collaboration that takes place, an interconnectedness. And as her research has demonstrated, trees communicate their needs to other trees and send nutrients via a network of fungi buried beneath the soil. Her book is a fascinating read, which I, which I commend to you. But in her interview, I came across this, this quote. It's, it's a little bit lengthy, but it's inspirational, and I want to share it with you. She writes, policies are important, global policies that say, we're going to decarbonize our future, we're going to get off of fossil fuels and find energy sources. These are all little things that are being put into place. But uh, all of these policies that are being put into place can lead to a tipping point. Not the negative ones, but the positive ones, where suddenly the system starts to become more cohesive again, more connected, healthier, and more whole. And I think it's really important, she says, for people to understand this, that what you do is not hopeless at all. 
Behind policies are behaviors and the way we think and putting these things in place. Suddenly the system will start to shift. Suddenly it'll hit a tipping point and it will improve. We'll start, we'll start drawing down CO2. We'll start seeing species coming back. We'll start seeing our waterways clean up. We'll start seeing whales and salmon coming back. But we've got to work and we've got to put the proper things in place. And she says it's so heartening when you see some of these things happening. And she ends it with this. I know that that's how we improve. That's how we improve. Small things, big things, but consistently moving it along until we get to those hopeful places, those tipping points. I find those words encouraging because much of what I read and hear can be discouraging. But the point is, it all works together. And it, all that we do that can help matters. And so we need to remain committed to even the little things that make a difference. And we know those little things. You mentioned them during the children's chat. The things that you and I can do. There's no list. Uh, there's no lack of information in finding lists on how we can reduce our carbon footprint. Things like buying less consumer goods. We just don't need all of that stuff. Buying fewer things, we actively benefit the climate. Uh, uh, sustainable shopping does that as well. And we know those, recycle, reuse, repurpose, regift, all the things that we need to continue to do and find ways of doing more. Create less food waste. According to the Washington Post, more greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture than from several forms of transportation combined. That means that if we reduce our food waste, it makes a difference. The biggest proportion of food waste, according to the Post, is, and that's 37%, happens in the home. So we need to be mindful of what we purchase and eat and throw away less food. It makes a difference. Weatherizing your home, we know, makes a difference. Reducing the energy to heat and cool homes improves uh, our energy efficiency. Consider your outdoor spaces. Maintain trees and plant perennials that grow deep roots that are drought tolerant and, and other things that we can do in our outdoor spaces. And consider carbon offsets, which by the way is very complicated as we know. You have to do your research. But, uh, but we can uh, think through some things to reduce our carbon usage. In the sermon manuscript that's printed out, I think at the door, but certainly online, there's uh, a little more of that information and links to other places where that information can be uh, obtained. But here's, here's one other thing that I think we need to take seriously. And that is to speak up, to speak up, speak out, to speak up about climate change to everyone in your life. Vote for candidates that, that are concerned, pass ballot measures that make a difference, that fight for climate change, but also share with family and friends what you are doing. Uh, be evangelists in this area. <laughs> share what you are doing with fan, family and friends and help them see ways that can make their lives a little more climate friendly. Now I know some of us have tried to do this. Some of us had, have had some of these conversations with loved ones and friends, particularly those who are religious conservatives and we've met resistance perhaps. I think it's important for us to think through and understand how Christian attitudes toward the environment and climate change are shaped. Because people have basic differing ideas about humanity's role in the created order. One view is called the dominion view. Can you guess what that's about? <laughs> it's 
It's very common among religious conservatives. Those who take a dominion view believe that God has given humans free reign to do with whatever we want with creation, the earth and its resources. That we're free to use it and misuse it and abuse it and exploit it and do anything we want uh, with, the, with creation because it's been given for our use. As you might guess, there's very little concern about climate change with this view. But there's another biblical view, and I believe it's pervasive in our scriptures, and that is earth stewardship. That God has given us the responsibility to care for this earth, to care for creation, that we are not at the center of creation, as Psalm 148 proclaims, but we have a responsibility to care for creation that we should be concerned. Now, it seems like this is just another area where politics gets in the way of our religion and does not allow us to have conversations, right? If you have a view of dominion on this side and a view of stewardship on this side, it seems like there's no way for these two to have a conversation. And that's where we sometimes get frustrated in our own conversations with loved ones. But there's recent research printed in Psychology of Religion and Spirituality that indicates that opinions by those who believe in the dominion view can be persuaded. How? When religious participants read passages from the Bible supporting stewardship, earth stewardship, they expressed greater concern for climate change compared with those who just read messages of dominion uh, values. For example, and this is what the research did, reading pro-environmental encyclical letters by, say, Pope Francis increased participants' belief in climate change. The findings suggest that environmental attitudes can be shaped by those who read uh, authorities of which they agree with, like, for instance, the Catholic Church and the Pope. Uh, that may not work for evangelicals, right? <laughs> that may not work for some that we have in our families and friends that may or may not uh, consider uh, the Pope's words uh, particularly helpful. However, there are evangelicals like Rick Warren and Leith Anderson and others that uh, have come forth with some very helpful material, very helpful writings and very helpful YouTube videos that speak to the language of religious conservatives and how earth stewardship is not only critical, but is part of our faith values. And so I commend those to you as well. Again, they're in the, in the sermon section for those who want to click on that. But here's the point. Anything that moves the needle toward climate concern and human behavior is important. So we have to speak out and speak up and be persistent and be loving, but be persistent. Given the urgency, every one of us needs to examine continuously how we can make a difference. So in feedback today, we'll hear from our friends at Aid Africa, who, who talk about some of the sustainable work they're doing. But we can also share our ideas on how we are addressing issues of climate change and how we're moving the needle a little bit in sharing that with friends and families. In the words of Suzanne Simard, and I'm going to close with these words, this is how we improve small things, big things but consistently moving it along till we get to those hopeful places, those tipping points that are good, to which I say, let's make it so. <laughs> Amen. Our last hymn this morning is number 425.
for the fruit of all creation. In body or spirit, I invite you to rise as we sing. for sharing with us in this time of worship today. We hope you'll stay a little longer and enjoy some coffee and cookies and, and community gathering either inside the space or be, go enjoy the beautiful outdoors as well. And then in about 10 minutes, we'll ring a bell and have time for feedback. We are sent forth in the name of God to live with love and compassion, to serve earth, and the peoples of earth. Will you care for creation? We will celebrate and revere all life within this community and beyond. We will care for creation. Help us, O oh God, to heal our earthly home. We end today's service with the Irish benediction. Some of you remember the before times when we used to do a, a thing with some movement. I've asked a few people to come up and demonstrate that this morning. We will all sing along from wherever you are, and these people will show you what the um, um, movements are. Do we have an even number? Ah, yes, we do. So think about how long it's going to be before you are ready to come and join this circle, or whether you prefer just singing along with us in the congregation. But it's coming. the rain. 
fields and until we meet again may God hold you in the hollow of their hand one more time say amen. amen.